This is Jerry Fry, audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. The following is the professional history of a PPB member told by himself on, in his own fashion on February 9th, 2015. These interviews are being recorded in order to compile firsthand a living history of the members of our organization and stories of their professional experiences. Many of our members began in what is called the golden age of radio and television, and this is an attempt to preserve as much of that data as possible for succeeding generations. This recording is not intended for broadcast, however, without first obtaining permission from Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. With me today at the CBS Studio Center in Studio City, California, is Tom Patterson. Tom's a member of the Board of Directors of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters, been on the board, what, about three years? Two years? Well, I was on the board, uh, boy, I, I did two terms, I think the first time, and then I termed out, and uh -huh. then uh, somehow they asked me back uh, several years later. Okay. And I guess they were desperate. So, uh, sort of like me. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, uh, Chuck Street called me up and said, hey, you, were, you know, we have a, an opening in the board of directors, so uh, would you be uh, interested in joining again? Uh-huh. So, well, I'm glad you do. Because very happy to, to attend. We need, we need good board members, and you are that. Thank you. So, Tom, <coughs> let's uh, go back to tell me where you were born and uh, a little bit about your, your childhood, your mother and father. Okay. Uh, well, I was born uh, December thirteenth, 1961, in Waukegan, Illinois, uh, at Great Lakes Naval Base. My father was uh, in the Navy, mm -hmm. and... Uh, I was a Navy brat, so we tended to move around about every two years after that. <coughs> and uh, uh, my father, uh, you know, was a career Navy man, and uh, he married my mother, uh, who was 100% uh, full-blooded Japanese. They met, you know, years after the war. And, uh, you know, she just packed up and moved to the moved to the states they, they, they met in japan they met in japan oh but, but after the war you said after the war was he met, stationed met, was he stationed there he was he was stationed in okinawa in okinawa and um yeah they uh i, I don't know how they but she barely spoke any english <laughs> he didn't speak any japanese isn't that amazing uh, somehow love conquers all i guess so yeah. and uh they they moved to the states and uh and uh, when my father was, was stationed at Great Lakes Naval Base, uh, uh -huh. that's where I was born. Uh, very good. That's, that's cold country. It is. It's uh, a bit chilly. <laughs> but uh, I love my Chicago roots, even though yeah. I've, I've only really only lived in Chicago probably for just mm -hmm. a few years. Yeah. Uh, I still am a diehard Cubs fan. We won't hold that against you. That's right. That's <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, who, who, who couldn't love a Cubs fan? You yeah, know, that's we, right. We've, been suffering for over, a, you know, 107 years now, right? It will, ev it will eventually happen, I'm sure. 1908, right? Is that the last <laughs> one? <laughs> I guess they're due. <laughs> I hope so. So your, your mother obviously learned to speak some English? She did. She ended up learning uh, some English. It was still broken, you know. Uh, now, did, did you s to learn Japanese when you were a kid? Not at all. No. <laughs> Not at all. Uh -huh. you'd, you'd think that I would have learned stuff, but she was busy learning English, mm -hmm. and uh, everybody else spoke English. So, any siblings? Nope, I'm an only child. You're an only kid. Once they fed me, they said that's it. <laughs> Are you a spoiled brat? Uh, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How about uh, grade school, high school? What were you doing? Uh, well, we, activities. Well, we moved around, like I said. So, from Chicago, we ended up in uh, Honolulu. Not a bad place? Not bad. Uh, I went to kindergarten and f first and part of second grade in Honolulu. And uh, then he was, you know, relocated again to uh, uh, Philadelphia. So I went from uh, Hon you know, Hawaii to uh, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. back to the cold, right? where I was there for uh, second grade and part of third grade. And uh, at that point, my father was uh, retiring from the Navy, 
and uh, decided, well, we're going to move to California. It is. And I'm going to retire in California <laughs> where the weather's a little nicer. Ah, well, that, was, that was good planning on his part. I, get I the think so. Get the Navy to pay for the move to California. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, you know, piled into our uh, 68 Chevelle and uh, drove to California and where I, I've been since, since 1968, uh, third grade all the way through, you know. You came directly to Southern California. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, lived most of my life in the San Fernando Valley. I currently live near Dodger Stadium up mm -hmm. in the hills of uh, Glacelle Park. And, uh, well, that's about it for uh, schooling, I guess. Did you, did you find <coughs> moving around uh, from school to school to be a problem for you, your, your friends that you leave behind and then you have to make new friends? Yeah, and? luckily I don't re recall most of that, but I'm sure at the time it was, I'm sure it was a bit traumatic as mm -hmm. a child. I, I, like I said, I don't have much recollection of, you know, any of my friends from, yeah. from the past, from those, those other cities, but I'm sure, yeah, yeah, I was heartbroken, you know, to pack sure. up and leave and leave my friends, you know, every few years. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, short memory, so. Fortunately, we right don't. Now, that's right. Right now, it's, you know, I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday, so. <laughs> well, yeah. we, just, we just had lunch today. I hope <laughs> Today, oh, we did. Yes. <laughs> I hope it was good. Uh, it was good. <laughs> uh, when you were in school, uh, what, 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 what part of your schooling were you in when you got, went to the valley here, moved to the valley? Uh, third grade. Third grade. And uh, some of my interests were... Uh, well, I was always like math, so math was uh, sort of, I would say, propelled me into engineering you know, in, in my later career. Mm -hmm. And uh, music, we ha I had, uh, I played the trumpet Good. in uh, elementary school, and then later on into uh, junior high school, uh, I was a member of the, the orchestra band in junior high and the, uh, the jazz band. And one of our, uh, our, our music teacher was a quite famous uh, studio musician. Mm. His name was Tommy Johnson. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, some of his notable uh, things that maybe people would know is, well, he always played in the Academy Awards. He was a tuba player. He was a very well-known tuba player in, in, the, in the industry. Wow. And he played... Uh, there aren't too many of those, I don't that's think. That's true. And uh, I mean, you can look him up in... Uh, in uh, I don't know Wikipedia or something, but uh, Tommy Johnson was uh, quite quite famous uh, for for what he did, and he uh, he was he played he did the the theme of Jaws from the movie Jaws. Oh, you know that the tuba a lot sound, of tuba the, stuff there. The, the, that was all him. Oh, very nice. And he also played uh, for Henry Mancini's band, mm -hmm. and he did uh, Amazing Grace, that tuba thing in Amazing Grace. That was Tommy Johnson. And, and he was he was a high he, school teacher. He was a, a junior high school junior teacher high. at Sepulveda Junior High School. Oh, good day. And uh, he was just you know that's he was studio musician and he loved teaching, and we didn't realize how famous he was until later on. Sure. He's, he's since passed on, but uh, but uh, we had we had excellent teachers. Oh boy, I guess. Yeah. What a great background and yeah. Did did you continue with trumpet? Uh, no. Once I got into high school. Not uh, at all. No, no. I I was thinking about joining either the marching band or sure. orchestra band there, but uh, now mm. I started getting into sports, playing baseball, and uh. tried out for football, but I wasn't I wasn't big enough for the football. Mm -hmm. And um, and when I was sixteen, this sort of leads into my my early career. When I was sixteen, I was uh, riding my bicycle. <laughs> Uh, around the neighborhood in a uh, radio, little radio station in the valley, KGIL. I mm -hmm. uh, rode, I used to, as, as a ch when I was younger, I used to ride my bike to their parking lot and they had a little remote trailer. And uh, people like Larry Van Eyes and uh, Tom Brown and all those guys used to do a remote broadcast from this little trailer, little orange trailer. And I used to ride my bike there and with my little transistor radio and watch them do the, do the broadcast and listen to it at the and same listen time. to it on the radio. That Exciting, was just, wasn't it? I was hooked. Yeah, I was absolutely hooked on uh, 
on radio, I think, at that point. So I just happened to be riding my bike, you know, just past, uh, past the radio station one time. And, uh, you know, I had a driver's license, but I was just, you know, just riding my bike just casually. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd stop in, just see if they have any openings, just a job opening in the mailroom. And sure enough, they, they, at that time, the mailroom person was just about to quit and move on. And uh, they said, well, you know, it's, you're in high school, we need to get a school permit and all this stuff. Uh, but can you start, you know, doing part-time stuff after school and just collecting the mail and then taking it down to the post office? Mm -hmm. I said, oh, that's great. Paid minimum wage, $2.65 an hour, which was more than I was making. Why not, why not work? Yeah, that's right. And uh, that's what I started to do after high school. So a lot of my extracurricular activity, like uh, playing baseball and stuff, I wasn't really good enough for the varsity. Mm -hmm. So I decided, well, I'd rather make money and go to, go to work after school sure. than uh, hang out and you know, play junior varsity. Did you see an application of your interest in mathematics to the broadcast, to the radio broadcasting? Uh, I, I've always had an interest in that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the mailroom only lasted maybe not quite a year, almost a year. But I started hanging out with the engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a small radio station, so the studios, the transmitter, uh, the sales and management offices. They're all together in this one little building. <clears throat> so, you know, I would just walk around and make friends with the engineers. Sure. And, you know, they were kicking back. They had a pretty good life. They, the ones that, uh, that I hung around with, there it was an old house converted to a transmitter building. So, so there was like a kitchen area there. And they always had beer in there. They always had, they always stocked it full of beer. And, really? And those guys were always drinking beer and playing tapes, you know, playing shows. And, uh, you know, it was always a comp. It was a, uh, uh, an operation where you had, you know, the announcer and then you had an engineer across the glass running the, running the board. Really? Yeah. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a combo operation. This is uh -huh. 1978. <clears throat> So I would, I would just, I would be fascinated. Still, even while I was working there, I would watch, watch the show, sure, and uh, watch the engineers. You know, they would get the cue and they play the cart, <coughs> play, and uh, you know, play tapes and do all kinds of sound effects. And I thought, man, that's that's cool. And uh, I said, how how do you how did you learn to do this? And they said, well, I don't know, just somebody taught me how to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, I want to do this. This is this is fascinating. Can I do that? And they would let me. They would let me. They, you know, after a while, they would they would let me just try it out. Just actually, I mean, do stuff on the air. Oh, great! Yeah, and then they would go get their beer. And <laughs> that amaz that amazing. Isn't that fascinating? It's amazing me, to me. Yeah. They were drinking on the job. They were. Yeah, <laughs> they were drinking on the job. Wow. Not while the management was around. This no, no, usually no, afterwards. Sure this is after hours where yeah. I would I would right. hang out after hours, and the building mm -hmm. was was closed, and a lot of the you know things were very loose back then. They were playing 45 RPM records? Uh, were they? No, they were playing, uh, well, we had an automation machine. We had a oh. reel-to-reel automation mm -hmm. uh, machine uh, back then. So uh, we were only, it was live assist uh, with the announcer. They just pushed the button, start the automation, and then it would play a couple of songs, and then it would go back to the live, right. to the live announce. <clears throat> and I said, I want to do this. I, I said, I, I want to do this. And they said, okay, well, you have to get your first class radio telephone license because we were a transmitter operation. Yeah. We can't hire you unless you have the first class radio telephone license. I'm gone. How do, I, how do I do that? Yeah. I said, well, you got to study, and then you have to go down to the FCC, uh, get your third class first, and then get a third class with the broadcast endorsement, and you have to pass the test, get your second class. And then, then you have to take the test for the first class. And uh, once you're hired, you know, that, or, or once, once you get the license, they said, we'll hire you. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay. 
So I went to, went to the bookstore and, you know, found a little book that says how to get your first class radio telephone license yeah. from, uh, I don't know, Walden Books or something. And, and I studied on my own while I was still in high school. Wow. I studied while I'm doing my, my school work. Uh, I, was, mm-hmm. I was studying and taking practice tests and studying for my, you know, my third, my second, and then eventually my first. And uh, in 1979, uh, I eventually went down to the FCC and passed my test. Wow. So I got my first class radio telephone license in 1979. I was, uh, I don't think I was, I was almost 18, I think. You were in high school still? Yeah, I think I I had just graduated. Graduated. I think we graduated, what, in July or something like that? And And I got my license, I think, in August. I have to look at my license, but. I think it was in August of 79. And sure enough, like, you know, they, they issue your little temporary white card mm-hmm. at the FCC. And I walked in and went, guess what, guys? <laughs> I got it. And they hired me on the spot. Oh, did they, they really? On the spot. The, uh, the guy that was, he was a, the engineering supervisor at the time. He said, well, I'm not feeling too good. I'm going to have to put you on duty right now. His father happens to be the vice president of engineering for the, the station, small station, but uh-huh. but uh, his dad was was a, a VP in the uh-huh. company, and they had already talked about this, and they said, well, if he, he's going down to take the test. If he takes the test, I want to hire him. So I got hired mm-hmm. at uh, 17 years old wow. as uh, an engineer at uh, KGIL. That was quite an accomplishment. I mean, you were dedicated. Looking back, uh, yeah, it was a lot of work. I mean, it was yeah, it was a lot of studying. Boy, that was not easy. It was, for, no. you know, the the uh, the second class. I don't know if you remember these these, yeah, these, you these tests. Mm-hmm. The second class was all tube theory. Yep. Which was, you know, I was not. I mean, where would I learn about tubes? You know. Sure. <laughs> so I, I, you know, a lot of studying, a lot of questions, and luckily we still had tubes at KGIL, so I, you know, I had a lot of help. <clears throat> And then the first class license was primarily television questions. Oh. Hmm. How would I learn, learn about that? Yeah. But it was just a matter of, uh, you know, learning the material. Mm-hmm. I didn't really learn it with experience. It was just, it was all book, book mm-hmm. knowledge. Sure. So I learned it from the books and learned it from the practice tests. And, you know, there was so many different practice tests. And I would, you know, just practice over mm-hmm. and over again. And uh, I eventually got the li- got the license. I passed the test. Great. So how long did you stay at KGIL then? I was there for twelve years, full time now. Uh, well, that, I was. I was. But they hired me part time to work work the weekends and, uh-huh. and vacation relief. And within a year, uh, the supervisor of engineering moved on to another job. Uh, he actually went to CBS Radio. There's kind of an interesting flow here that <clears throat> uh, one of the supervisors went to Lockheed and another one went to CBS Radio. So there was an opening for the supervisor's position. And the, the VP of engineering took a chance and made me supervisor of engineering, engineering supervisor. After how many years? Uh, I was there for about a year. About a year? So I was, I was 18 years old. And you became the supervisor? I was the engineering supervisor oh, wow. at KGIL, and I was supervised. Everybody was older than me, and one of the guys I supervised used to engineer for the Sweet Dick Whittington show, uh, Joe Puja, and he, I, he, was, he was about my father's age. Mm. <laughs> so... But I was very helpful to him and very nice and everything. So we, you know, I thought there would be a little resentment. But he didn't. He didn't want the the supervisor's job. Yeah. And they thought I was ambitious enough to to handle it mm-hmm. and you know manage the uh, the schedule and vacations and you know take care of all the daily operations. Sure. And uh, I stayed there until 1990. Wow. Uh-huh. So well, good for you. Obviously the. <coughs> Thought you did a good job. Yep, they they took a chance, and mm. uh, not a you know eighteen year old snot nosed kid. And <laughs> they gave me a, so a lot ra- of responsibility. So radio was your thing at that point. Yes, sir. <coughs> uh, 
Now, what happened after that? Well, uh, since my friend had left KJL to move on to CBS, I started getting an interest into the big time because KJL is just a, a little station. They're, like they're 5,000 watt? 5,000 watt mm -hmm. AMR. No. And we had uh, 3,000 watt FMR. And uh, so he's telling me all the great stuff. He, was, he went to KNX and uh, KNX FM at Columbia Square. And I would go and visit him and say, oh, this is great. What a great place. <laughs> Man, I'd love to work here. Sure. And uh, so I applied. I just applied. Early on, I applied. And they said, oh, sorry, Tom, there's no, you know, first you don't have a lot of experience, but uh, they just don't, uh, they just don't, don't move from that position. The positions just don't, don't change. Sure. <clears throat> so it took me eight years of applying for that job that didn't exist, mm -hmm. that, that didn't have an opening. Uh, and then finally in 1990, my friend that moved from KGIL to CBS Radio, he and his boss moved to Disney, uh -huh. to Walt Disney Imagineering in Glendale. Mm -hmm. So his boss went there and made an offer to, to my friend Mike to come over, come over to Disney and work over there, where he's still at today. Hmm. And that created an opening in, in, at CBS. So I followed him, his position from, from KGIL. I ended up taking his supervisor position at KGIL. Mm -hmm. He moved on to CBS Radio. Then he left CBS Radio, and I took his job yes. at CBS Radio. Following right it along. took eight years of persistent uh, <laughs> uh, calling the director of engineering. Mm -hmm. Every year I kept, kept my resume current, made phone calls, very friendly. Mm -hmm. I did it the right way to try and Good. schmooze my way into the job, and when they finally had the position open, I was first on their list. They called me up and said, okay, come on in. We got an opening. Excellent. So That was KNX FM? KNX. It was KNX News Radio, and it was for both. Oh, we, we, for took both. Care, we took care of both the uh, okay. second floor and the fourth floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would primarily be, be responsible for, we only had one engineer up in FM, and that's where Mike worked. And... Uh, I went up there and, you know, just there. but I learned the operation of KNX News Radio also. But, mm -hmm. but my primary responsibility was the FM on the fourth floor. <coughs> and uh, I stayed at... Uh, so you worked for, the, for George Nicola. I did. I worked for George Nicola. I understand he was a great guy. He was. He was a very good guy. Very. Uh, he was kind of cheap. He didn't want to spend a lot of money. No. But he uh, he had a very profitable uh, business operation, and he liked to keep it profitable. Sure. And one of the things that they kind of lacked at KNX was their technology. They didn't really move into the new age of digital and all that. They were still doing tapes and mm. edits on you know with razor blades. And oh my gosh. Yep, they're still doing all that stuff. <clears throat> when places like KFI even KFWB, uh, they were doing, uh, you know, digital mini discs and doing editing that way. Mm -hmm. But George didn't want to spend the money. So we, we stayed with tapes for <laughs> tapes and carts, <laughs> card machines for a very long time. It reminds me of a guy I worked <coughs> with up in Great Falls, Montana, mm -hmm. at the CBS radio station. Didn't believe in 45 RPM records. <laughs> By God, we're going to stick with the 78s. Yep. <laughs> Well, that's an uh, interesting thing is uh, when I have a little note on here that they were mentioning turntables and all that stuff at the, at the luncheon today. And I was the last person to play a, a large ET uh, for a public service show at yeah. KGIL. We used to have a great big turntable, uh -huh. and we had an ET. I forgot how big they were there, but they were larger than a standard LP. 16-inch. Yep, 16-inch. There yep. you go. Electronic transcript. Is that mm -hmm. what it was? ET. ET. And it was a public service show. It was, I uh, can't hardly forget it. It was a public service show that I ran on Sunday mornings, early in the morning, 6 o'clock, I think it was. It was called 
Meyer Mitchell's moment. Meyer Mitchell's mortuary. Moments of meditation. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> well, that was what, yeah, you put the you know, put the put it on there, and it would yeah. just it would just go. Yeah. The full you know half an hour, and that was their public service because they had to do a certain amount of public service, and they always ran it on Sunday morning. Oh, very so nice. that was. Uh, <laughs> and then after that, all the public service came in on reel to reel. So sure, I was the last person. Now there's a, somewhere down the road I could tell you another piece of trivia in Los Angeles where I was a part of, but uh, I was I was the last person to play an ET on uh, at KGIL. That's amazing. And it was that wasn't that was still probably early '80s mm -hmm. when that happened. So, you know, it wasn't, I mean, it's amazing they still had ETs back, back then. You'd be hard pressed to find <coughs> a 16 inch turntable these days. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was an old Rusco, well, we used to call it a Rusco rum, Rumble Master. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Frank Brzee had him in his uh, home uh, studio. Oh yeah, I was, I was talking to uh, mm. uh, Don King, I was hoping maybe Don King would still have a working turntable. Uh -huh. Because they were talking about the earthquake, uh, Chuck Sopkoff was yes. talking about the earthquake uh, uh, LP from KGIL. Mm -hmm. And I, when Chuck left, Chuck was the, the historian there. And uh, when when he left KGIL, all of his stuff, all the pictures and all this wonderful stuff from KGIL was left in the shed. And one time they said, what are we going to do with all this crap? And they were just saying, well, just get rid of it. And yep. I said, don't you dare get rid of it. I said, if you're going to throw that stuff out, I'm taking it. Yeah. And they said, fine, take it all. And I took all of Chuck's old stuff. And Chuck had newspaper clippings, pictures, you know, stuff when he invaded Catalina. And they did all kinds of, you know, he went to the Louvre to hang a picture and got thrown out. And mm. Spent Dick Whittington and all of, all of those things. And I took all of those archives and I took them home. Good. I've got them in my garage still. Good for you. And one of those one of those things that were in there were those were those little earthquake mm -hmm. uh, LPs that they were talking about with Bill Smith and, right. and Chuck Southcott. And I, I went and I said, I've got that. We need to digitize this. We need to put this on you know, in a digital format. This is you know, but I don't have a turntable that works. Yeah. So I'm hoping Don King might have a working turntable or I'd love to get that digitized. Don King I think does have. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe I can talk yeah. him into doing yeah. that. Okay, great. So you're at KNX. Yep. And you were there for how long? Uh, KNX uh, from 1990 to 1999. Mm -hmm. I was there for nine years. Um, that's in, in 1999. I was re actually recruited by the director of engineering at uh, Channel Two. We uh, he called me up one time and we went to the lunchroom and uh, he offered me a position at Channel Two. In the same building. In the same building, because <clears throat> uh, some of my predecessors that that I knew and made friends with, they ended up going to work at Channel 2. And when they had a position open, they said, well, who should we approach to get, you know, fill this position? And a couple of them mentioned my name over in radio. Because mm -hmm. I had no, I wanted always, my whole career, I wanted to be in TV somehow. But how do you get from radio to TV, Right. When did you start becoming interested in TV? Uh, once I got into Columbia Square, ah, okay. and Channel Two was in the same building, there you go. and I would wander into to Channel Two, and I, you know, instead of, you know, I got used to you know live radio. Sure. So then I would go and watch. I would stand in the in the stage, and I watch them do the TV mm -hmm. uh, news newscasts. And I thought, wow, this is this is cool, and I'd love to work here. Uh -huh. How do I do it? How do I do it? Because I don't I don't have any TV experience. No, I own a couple of TVs, but that's that's it. Sure. But uh, the, the director of engineering over there uh, said, you know, you, your name has been mentioned. <coughs> a couple of people have mentioned your name, and they think you would be a great addition over in the studio maintenance department over here at Channel Two. And I, I was honest with them. I said, you know, I don't have any experience, which is probably deadly to anybody else. If you, if you say that, I said, I don't have, however, uh, his name is Dick Lottie, and, and I said, Dick, I'm trainable. I said, you can show me and teach me to do anything. I said, just put me in front of the, somebody who is willing to teach me what I need to know. Mm -hmm. And I said, 
I can do it. Like I said, I can do anything. And uh, he said, good enough for me. Hmm. And he called my boss and said, you know, we're interested in, you know, transferring Tom over to TV. And they weren't too happy about that, but no. <laughs> but it were it was the wish it was my wishes, right? And they said, okay, well, give us a couple of months. You know, they didn't release me right away. They had to try and find a suitable replacement for me, right? <coughs> So, uh, oh, by the way, I was hired in at KNX as an assistant supervisor because mm. I had had supervisory experience for 12 years at KGIL. Yes. So they hired me in as an assistant supervisor at uh, KNX and KCBS FM. And uh, so after you know a couple of months went by, I transferred across the hall, and they started teaching me television. Fascinating. Just mm -hmm. fascinating. You know, radio with pictures. It was just uh, just amazing. Now you'd had a little exposure with your first phone yes. uh, ex uh, right. studies, but Correct. that wasn't practical stuff. No, it was just stuff that I, I had learned just to pass the test. Sure. <clears throat> and uh, it was about a year, I think, yeah, 2000, year 2000, so towards the end of the year 2000, uh, the director of engineering called me in, and uh, see everybody at, at, at in studio maintenance. Almost everybody had a supervisor title. That was the way they <clears throat> they bumped their pay. So they got extra pay, but nobody was responsible. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was no nobody was actually supervisor of the department, even though everybody was at a supervisor classification. But nobody wanted to do anything. Right. So. Funny, after about a year, only a year in television, the director of engineering uh, at, the, at the time was, was Steve Blue, who was, uh, I don't know, he's, he used to be a news director at Channel 2, and then he took over for engineering. He liked the way I was able to organize things and get along with people, and I was able to get people to do things. So he said, I'd like to make you the lead supervisor in the studio maintenance department. I've had one year experience in television. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to just, you know, do the same thing, you know, organize the vacations and do the scheduling and uh, take care of maintenance. And I said, absolutely. You know, thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. So they made me supervisor of uh, studio maintenance. Wow. One year. That's fantastic. I, I couldn't believe it. You must be a quick study, Tom. Well, that, you know, I, I, I told them, it's, uh, you know, you could teach me to do anything. Yes. Just, just sit somebody down in front of me and Boy, that's teach great. me. I'm a sponge. I'll, I'll, I'll absorb it and uh, mm -hmm. I will, you know, I'll, I'll just learn as much as I can about it. <coughs> Excellent. So... In studio maintenance, let's see, I was there for six years at uh, Channel 2, <laughs> and uh, they, they had an opening over at Television City, and uh, I had made friends with the uh, director of engineering at uh, Television City. <coughs> And they approached me again. They said, hey, we've got an opening here at Television City. <laughs> Would you be interested <laughs> to go work in the broadcast uh, maintenance department uh, where we handle the satellite uplinks and all the fiber and cable TV uh, infrastructure and uh, the LATX operation for the West Coast? And, uh, you know, apparently I had a good reputation, and uh, they offered me the position. They transferred me again mm -hmm. from television over to network. Uh -huh. So through all this time, I've had one employer, KGIL, which was Buckley Broadcasting, and then CBS, which is where I'm currently at. There aren't too many <coughs> people around <coughs> these days that can say that. In broadcasting, that yes. has two employers? No. no. I don't think so. And this is a span over, what, 30, 36 years, mm -hmm. 37? No. 
I don't know if you can count the mail room, but if, oh, you, sure. do, if you count the mail room, it's 1978. So <laughs> uh, this will be my 37th year in broadcasting. I've worked for two companies. Wow. Fantastic. And uh, I don't know. Where, where did you and Rick Scarry uh, work? Together? KGIL. KGIL. Yeah, Rick was the program director uh, there when I was in the mailroom. Mm. So back in 78. And then he left, I think, to go to KMET. I think he left mm -hmm. at that point. And Rick and I have remained good friends yeah. ever since. Good. Excellent. And uh, I've been at uh, TV City now s uh, since uh, 2000, mm -hmm. 2005. At the end of 2005. And your current position is what? Supervisor of Technical Operations. Technical Operations. Yeah, they hired me in as a supervisor. Uh -huh. uh, one of our guys, the senior uh, supervisor there who's been there 40 years, they were anticipating he was going to retire. Mm. So they wanted to bring me in to learn everything I can and then take over the department when he retires. Uh -huh. He hasn't retired yet. <laughs> Was Charles Kappelman still there? No, he, he had already retired. retired. Yeah, he retired, I believe, a couple of years before mm -hmm. I got there in uh, 2005. Yeah. <coughs> but now they have his two two big studios over there. Oh, South yes. Stages. Yeah, yeah, 36 and 46. They're uh, <coughs> quite busy. Apparently. What, what shows come out of there? I know American Idol. American Idol, Dancing, Dancing. with the Stars. Uh, right now we're doing the Late Late Show temporarily in that stage. Oh. But uh, they did do So You Think You Can Dance, <coughs> X Factor, which is now canceled. Right. Uh, they did uh, several other shows, uh, but they've been canceled too. Mm -hmm. We like shows to be successful, even if they're on other networks yeah. in our lot, because it keeps everybody employed, and, mm -hmm. and uh, they're all happy when that happens. I get a <coughs> kick out of w watching George Finocchio and Channel 7 oh, re yeah. report about Dancing with the Stars. From the Fairfax, Fairfax district. district. Yes, they won't mention CBS <laughs> at all. But I always find it fascinating that when when they go, you know, the people have tickets to go see the live show, mm -hmm. that they would, uh, it's like, oh, go report to Television City. And they go there and they see a big CBS eye on the wall. Wrong and they wonder, Wait a minute, we're supposed to, isn't this a Fox show? Yeah. Isn't this an ABC show? It's like, yeah, it is. Does ABC have any uh, audience studio at all? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Do they? Where? Well, they, yeah. Oh you, oh, you mean... Uh, ABC. ABC. Yeah. In other words, a, 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 an ABC show like Dancing with the Stars, nothing big enough to... Re I don't... I would think that Disney a lot would have a soundstage. Yeah. If they aren't booked, I guess. I don't know why. It, the thing is, they would have to rent... They would have to rent a production truck. They would have mm -hmm. to rent an uplink truck. They would have That's to crew true. it. Uh, where TV City, they mm -hmm. just... They rent the whole thing. We, we uplink it. And we have a production facility, a very modern production facility. We do set designing, we do all of the, the sets and we have the crew. Mm -hmm. It's all one-stop shopping at TV City, so sure. uh, they just go and write a check. Yeah. And then it, we, we uplink uh, from TV City to ABC New York and uh, they broadcast it on their, uh, for their networks. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, Good. yeah, they're happy. Fox, same way. But you work on those shows as well? Yes, uh, since I'm in the uh, transmission center uh, I'm the maintenance person for uh, transmission so mm -hmm. satellite transmission and uh, fiber transmission you know anything in and out of the building yeah uh, that has to do with broadcast uh, falls into our our domain mm -hmm. and uh, that's we're just responsible for keeping it all keep it all going sure so live TV is our specialty that's what we do What's the biggest problem these days in uh, dealing with uh, the technical end of television? Well, I'll tell you, that the equipment is, is so good, and we have redundant systems, and even sometimes third redundancy. Uh, it's just, you know, minor resetting of cards and boards and stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the stuff just works. It's, it, it's amazing that you don't have as many, you know, problems mm -hmm. <coughs> anymore. Before you had, you know, problems with video and everything analog. You had to adjust everything. Oh, of course. You know, but uh, now it's, you know, it's not perfect. But, uh, you know, most of the time it's just a matter of rebooting something. Everything's a computer. Everything's a microprocessor. Yeah. And they, it gets, 
it gets screwy every once in a while, but you just need to power cycle it and, mm-hmm. or have put in a spare board. And we don't do any component level repairs anymore. And we have soldering irons in our shop, but they yeah. never get fired up. You don't dare, you know, <laughs> no. you don't dare heat up a, <laughs> a multi-layer board, you know, with yeah. nine layers, and you can just destroy the whole mm-hmm. board. So, and no tubes in the house. Uh, only in the transmitter. Klystron yeah. tube in the transmitter. Is there one still in there? Oh yeah, yeah. we've got uh, six transmitters in the Earth station, and mm. they're all they're all tube. So transmitters are not digital yet. Uh, no, not not quite. Will they ever be? Do you think? Uh, yeah, possibly. Mm-hmm. I think it, it it might it might happen. A lot of power uh, though. Yep, the we're going to solid state. They they do have solid state. Uh, power amplifiers now, uh, but we don't have them yet. Mm-hmm. But they're talking about it. That's the upgrade. The upgrade is uh, is coming. Well, the NAB every year they always come out with new equipment. Oh yeah, upgraded equipment. Uh, but you have things that work now, so yeah, they've been running uh, quite well for probably. I think those Klystron tubes are have been running for about 12 years now. Uh-huh. Some are original. Some yeah. are original tubes. They're, they're 3,000 watt tubes, but we run them at about 100 mm-hmm. watts, 200 sure. watts. So, you know, they're they're just sleeping. They're not even they're not even trying to work. You know, when you run them sure. at full power, then you're going to have a shortened life. But when you run them at you know uh, 100, 200, 300 watts, and they're rated for 3,000, you know, it's not even not even a strain on those. So that's how we've been able to get 10 years on some of these tubes. How big a pro- uh, project was it for when you converted from uh, regular to high def in your studio? That was quite a quite a deal. That uh, we had to upgrade, you know, the router, uh, upgrade, you know, our monitors, upgrade transmission line, you know, the lines, of, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the coax cables that ran from one studio to another. If it's the wrong type of cable, or if the run is too long. Could have problems with uh, with the high def signal, mm-hmm. so we had to upgrade the entire infrastructure. Plus, in house cable that was another thing. Sure. Uh, people wanted to see stuff in high def on the in house cable. Well, we have to upgrade encoders and modulators. Oh boy. And, yeah. and everything had to be upgraded. So that was that was quite a uh, mm-hmm. undertaking too. All new cameras. All new cameras. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the cameras that they purchased early on were high def capable, even though the show was not in high def. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they had uh, some high def cameras, but they would down down res to oh, really? standard def until the show finally became high def. No. So this is this was early on. This is yeah. early, you know uh, really early on in, in high definition. Would it cost more to produce the show in high def? Is that why they would probably it? because they didn't have editors that were uh-huh. high def. Uh-huh. You know they still had the old. Standard def yeah. editors. So, so when when you make the leap to high def, it's it's quite a leap. You just don't upgrade one thing. You no, have to upgrade everything. the in, the entire infrastructure. So lighting too. Huh? Yeah, that's true because the lighting. You know, they, they you get better resolution, better pictures. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you want to light the person better because you, any flaws in the lighting, you're going to see it. <coughs> Even affects the makeup people. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> so. A lot of the talent didn't didn't appreciate high def. I'm sure they didn't. <laughs> I want to ask you a question that has been bugging me for some time, and you probably can answer it. On Dancing with the Stars, for instance, mm-hmm. when they dance on that floor, patterns evolve on the floor. I can't figure out is it a projection? Are they dancing on uh, on projections coming from up? Uh, up beneath, or is it all digitally applied? I, I wish I knew. I, I don't. You don't um, know. I don't know. That's not. Uh, I'm not the uh, studio. You know, I don't have that much to do with the studio operations. Yeah. Uh, I usually get the the product when it's finished. It comes out of the switcher. Okay. And they send it over to me. But you, <coughs> you know what I'm talking about. I do. I do. Uh, I'm sorry, but I don't. I don't have an answer for that. <coughs> I don't know. I'm assuming they're, they're, they're <coughs> dancing on uh, an LED floor, maybe. Could be. They keep upgrading every time the every time the show comes back. It's something bigger and better, or, you know, with the sets and mm-hmm. technology. And, um, but that's been going on for the last couple of years, so yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I'm correct. 
But the, the the LED panels and the LED screens in the background now are, are commonplace. Oh yeah, uh, okay. they can do anything. Just about they uh, they have a whole different set of engineering an engineering group that just handles just the effects. I'm sure. You know, they, it's just the regular engineering. They don't take care of that. It's like they hire a company to do <coughs> to do the fancy lighting and you know the fog machine and yeah. all that stuff. That that's all computerized. So. I remember back in the early 60s when the first the first special effects generator came into our master control room at the NBC channel in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And everybody's so excited. Look what we can do. We can, we can make circles. Yes. And we, can, we can split the screen. And we had to put the brakes on because they wanted to use it all the time just because they had it. Fascinating. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, now tell me about the last night with the Grammy Awards. Yep, yep. And you were there doing what? Uh, transmission, uh, satellite uplink, uh, transmission fiber to New York. Uh, so we take the final product, you know, just like I do at work. We do the final product, and uh, we send it. Uh, we send it to New York. <coughs> Today, uh, this was this is the first one. We send it completely uncompressed. Mm -hmm. uh, HDSDI 1.5 gigs straight to New York, so we didn't have to you know, compress it just to transport it. Uh, this is my eighth Grammy in a row. So this is, oh, is. the eighth one that I've done. Have they all been from Staples Center? They've all been from Staples. And they're various, I've watched it grow from, you know, various uh, transmission techniques. You know, before we had, you know, encoders and we would encode to go on fiber, and then encode to go up on satellite. And now we just encode just to go up on satellite. We mm. had three three fibers leaving Staples Center, all high def, and then we were we we set it up on satellite as a ba as another backup. So quite a bit of uh, money involved. So you know my overtime pay is nothing compared to you know whatever they whatever they they make in yeah. you know a big show like that. Uh -huh. It's one of the top shows that. CBS produces. Indeed. And uh, I've been, you know, privileged to work, you know, the last Super Bowl also. Uh, the guys in New York, for some reason, they like me. Mm -hmm. And they like my work, so they've asked me to be part of the team. So I worked the uh, super, the last CBS Super Bowl in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Super Bowl 47, I think mm -hmm. it was. And I had been begging to, to work on those shows for years. I bet. And, and then finally they uh, they said, okay, uh, you sure you want to do this? And I'm going, absolutely, let's do it. <laughs> okay, two and a half weeks, New Orleans. Uh -huh. And I was part of that, uh, the Super Bowl experience. And now they, they've already asked me to do the next one. Because exactly. we get the next Super Bowl in uh, Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. So that's a CBS Super Bowl. So they've already asked me. They said, okay, so you're all set to go, right? <laughs> okay, I'll be there next January. Okay. Well, that's terrific. Uh, that'll be fun. Yeah. I only saw one goof last <coughs> night, and I'm not watching that carefully, but uh, country group Dwight Yoakam and the gal that was singing with him mm -hmm. finished their number in the, in the center platform stage and got the applause and just stood there and stood there mm. and stood there. <laughs> I timed it. I went back on and was recording it went back. They were there for 40 minutes, uh, 40 seconds, wow. just standing there, because apparently um, Paul McCartney and he, the other two were not ready, <laughs> <laughs> and they had to wait, because yeah. the, the camera finally very slowly tilted up and zoomed in at the area where they were going to perform, but nothing was happening until about a few, minutes, a few seconds later. Yeah, live TV, isn't it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, they, they just stood there and, and looked. They didn't. And and they do a full dress rehearsal before the show. They do. They do. But they, they didn't. Normally, the, in the past, they try to do a full dress rehearsal, which is as if it were live, mm -hmm. up to time and everything. But this one, they didn't. They didn't go from from start to finish. They there were some screw ups in the middle, and then they stopped, uh -huh. redid it, and stuff like that. But okay. in the past, they used to do full blown dress rehearsals as if we were live on the air. Wow. Timing and everything. So yeah, well, that, that would work out some yep. of the kinks, I guess. Yeah, except they couldn't get some of the talent, some of the big, big-headed talents don't want to do <coughs> rehearsal, so they don't show up. Oh, dear. 
so they show up the uh, f just for the live show. So yeah, things are things are different. I think they I think they mandate it now. I think you have to. Well, I would think so. Yeah, they I think they have. Uh, Do they get paid for doing a show like that? I don't know. I'm curious. I don't know. And if they got paid, then that would be a, something <coughs> cool over their heads. Yeah. Now tell us a little bit about the uh, Tom Patterson personal life. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, going back to my younger days, one of the things I was fascinated with as a child is uh, flying, flying airplanes. Mm -hmm. So I took my first flying lesson when I was 14 okay. <laughs> at Van Nuys Airport. I talked my parents into uh, shelling out a few bucks and taking flying lessons. And I, I took quite a number of flying lessons at 14, but you couldn't solo until you were 16. So the money kind of dried up, so I didn't I didn't resume flying uh, single engine planes until much later, much later in life. Uh, so that's one of my passions. Um, and let's see, uh, I'm a ham radio operator. Uh, still, still, mm -hmm. yep, uh, journal class, ham mm -hmm. radio. Did you ever talk to Ray Bream? Uh, no, yeah. no. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, but I met Ray Breve at uh, you know Pacific Pioneer yeah. Broadcasters. He sure. seemed uh, seemed very nice. But He's a great ham. Yeah. Was a great ham. Was uh, a great ham. Yeah. Christianado. Uh, another thing is uh, another entity of my life. Uh, when I was at KGIL, another thing that I was I was fascinated with was law enforcement. <clears throat> and a friend of mine is, was a LAPD motor sergeant who since became a councilman, Denizine, Councilman Denizine, or former councilman now. Uh, he used to come by KGIL and I used to make tape dubs for the public service announcements. Announcements, you know, don't shoot your gun up in the air for New Year's, don't drink and drive, and all that kind of stuff. I would dub all those things for free for the mm. company. I would just, he would just come over and give me some stuff and he'd have all the materials and he just needed somebody to rack it up and just make, uh, you know, 20 copies that he can send out to other radio stations. Mm -hmm. So Dennis was talking to me one time uh, and said, uh, you ever thought about being a reserve officer? And you're going, well, what's that? Because uh, I would always ask him questions about being a police officer. And just something I probably would have done if I didn't get into radio. And uh, he explained it to me, and he says, uh, you'd probably make a pretty good reserve officer. I'm going, really? That is fascinating. I will, I'll check it out. So I went through the interview process and application and physical agility and background check and medical and did all that stuff. I got accepted to the academy. Hmm. And in 1984, I uh, went through the police academy. It was nine months of training. They don't get paid. No, reserve officers oh, don't no? get paid. Oh. At the time, it was $15 a month. It was a stipend that the city gives you. Yeah. <clears throat> but I uh, had to go, while I was working at KGIL, I had to attend evening classes, Monday and Wednesday night, from 6 till 11. Did training, classroom training, and we did shooting and tactical training, physical fitness on Saturday and Sunday. Every other weekend was a full weekend, eight hours. And we did that for nine months. You mm -hmm. do it all voluntary. It's all, you want to do this? Okay. And uh, I graduated uh, in 1985. And uh, I graduated as a, as a patrol officer. I've heard so. Say. So uh, I worked in Van Nuys the, the whole time. I was a Van Nuys uh, patrol officer and it's what we do is we just uh, we call up the watch commander and say hey, yeah it's reserve officer Patterson uh, can you put me on the lineup for tomorrow because absolutely I had a little magnet and they used to just put me mm -hmm. and they would assign me a car and I would work with a partner and we would go answer 911 calls and drive around wow and Part a partner is also reserve or uh, regular uh, regular had to be regular in the beginning yeah through probation they had an 18-month probation period, so you could wash out, and mm -hmm. you know you're always learning. So, and then after so many hours, so many thousands of hours actually, 
you can petition the uh, police commission for uh, what's called a certified designated level one uh, status, which you know doesn't mean anything, but to a reserve officer, that's the highest level of reserve officer you can you can qualify for. That means you can carry a gun off duty. You have full peace officer powers of arrest off duty, uh, and you can work by yourself. You can work with other reserves. You're essentially the same as a training officer, and uh, so you you're exa you're treated like a, a regular officer. Mm. You can work any detail you want. So that's the highest classification in the state of California. And uh, yeah, I achieved that, that level. And uh, i um, just been doing that until I just recently retired uh -huh. uh, in October. Uh -huh. uh, I retired at 30 years, <coughs> 30 years working for the LAPD Wow! in October. And uh, Was that fun? Did you enjoy it? It was fun. It was... The only reason to do it for no pay is because you enjoy doing it. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's it's dangerous. I it's, would think. Uh, you know, we're we're still exposed. I mean, our uniforms, our badge. I, I mean, everything looks exactly the same. You can't tell the difference between a reserve and a, mm -hmm. and a regular officer. Uh, but the only reason, the only motivation to do it is because you enjoy it. It's fun. I enjoy the adrenaline rush. I enjoy, you know, going lights and sirens in a police yeah. car. I love, I, you know, going to a man with a gun call. It was just exciting for me. They, everybody thinks I'm crazy, but <laughs> it's it's one of those things. There are there are, I think about 800, uh, less than a thousand, reserve officers in LAPD, and only about I think 200 or so that are field qualified mm -hmm. that actually work the, the streets. Other other reserve officers work the desk or they work uh, in various other capacities like chaplain or something like that. But I'm a, I'm a uh, field police officer. I, I, work, I work in a black and white. Yeah. You know, Boy. answering 911 calls in the middle of the night. That's it's terrific. Fun stuff. So I just, yeah. just recently retired. <coughs> Excellent. At 30 years. So I'm still waiting for my 30-year pin. That's coming up mm -hmm. next month. You presented from now, the chief. Somewhere <laughs> along the line, you got married, I assume? I did. I got married uh, in 1990, which was an interesting year because that was, you know, they say there's uh, three three real important things of your life. It's you get married, uh, you change jobs, and I don't know, mm -hmm. there's a death in the family or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I moved and got the job at CB, uh, got married and Got the job at, at CBS. So let's see, I married, changed jobs, and moved. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we <laughs> so we did three, three different things, three traumatic moves, all in the same year. Where did you meet your wife? Uh, at a friend's house. Uh, that's another whole different story, which I can't really get into. It's yeah. just that it's just you know, there's just not enough time on your yeah. your thing. But uh, we we just met from friends. Mm -hmm. My friend was dating her sister, and she had just graduated from college, and and we just we just met and hit it off. And, and how old were you then? Let's see, 1987, so 26, I think it was. Uh huh. Good. Yeah, it's a good age. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, we got married in 1990, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. almost three years of you know. Sure. Children. Uh, yep. Got uh, two kids. I've got a daughter that's graduating from college. Oh wow. In May. Mm -hmm. She's in St. Louis, St. Louis University, and my son is a sophomore in high school mm -hmm. in La Cunada, St. Francis. Good. Uh, what else? Let's see. Talked about that. Yeah, I'm a member of AFTRA and Screen Actors Guild. I've been in a couple of movies. Have you? Uh, as an extra. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons I joined AFTRA was they were sort of sister unions mm -hmm. where I was hoping to get into the Screen Extras Guild when that existed. And uh, so I joined AFTRA in 1983. And uh, just, I was just uh, extras in a couple of movies, just, you know, stupid movies, just yeah. low, low budget stuff. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and then luckily a few years ago, 
Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA have merged. And all of a sudden, I'm a member of Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. There you, you know, go. with a, with a with a uh, uh, anniversary date of you know 1983. So it looks mm -hmm. like I've been a member of Scre Screen Actors Guild for a long time. Sure. Even though I haven't, but and uh, I'm a I'm a national voting member of the uh, Television Academy. So it's nice getting those screeners in the in yep. the mail and and voting for uh, for the Emmys. Mm -hmm. And. Yeah, I'm a member of Board of Directors, PPB, the Society of Television Engineers, and the Southern California Frequency Coordination Committee. Uh, I love to travel. Uh, 1980, I did an eight-week tour of Europe. Wonderful, uh, low-budget thing through a company called International Student Exchange from Champaign-Urbana, <coughs> but for about, I think it was $1,800. Wow. Airfare, hotel, food, all the transportation and the tours. For eight weeks? Yep. For what year again? 1980. Oh, well, maybe. We flew over on Laker Airways, Freddie uh -huh. Laker Airways uh, into Gatwick, and then yeah. they met us there. It was it, it was something under $2,000. I forget what exactly, but it was very it was right in there. It was, it was mid, you know, $1,300, $1,500, mm -hmm. 1800 somewhere around there. And toured all through Europe for eight weeks. Excellent. Fa fascinating wow. because yeah. it was uh, Eastern Bloc was still there. So we were sure. in Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, East Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, all those places where, you know, that don't exist anymore. Yep. <clears throat> and, Did uh, you get to Japan? Have yes, you I have been to Japan. Uh, my, my mother took me there uh, a couple of times. Uh, we went to visit their family one time, and then we went back for a funeral mm -hmm. a few years later. And uh, let's see, what else? Uh, I do spring training every year. I go to, I love the uh, going to Arizona and uh, do spring training. I'm going to do that next month, right around St. Patrick's Day. We group of our friends that a lot of them have gone for 20 years, 30 years sometimes. Uh, we go to spring training. We go to the ball, ball games and eat and drink and have fun. And it's just sort of like a boys' club kind of thing. And we go and watch ball games. We, see the Cubs there and the Angels and Dodgers now <clears throat> it was it, it was better when the Dodgers weren't there because it was everything, oh. everything was real cheap and ticket yeah. prices were cheap and everything was easy to get hotels now now the Dodgers are uh, on the west coast and uh, this is in Phoenix this is in Phoenix yeah yeah we, we stay in Tempe but mm. you know everything is real close Mesa and right Tempe, you know so we travel out to Glendale to go to the Dodgers uh, camp <clears throat> But it was it was more fun when the Dodgers weren't there. But because <laughs> when they're in Florida, you know, yeah, and here it's just so close that everybody in Los Angeles goes. Right now, there's no hotel rooms, and there's oh my gosh, yeah, how we doing there? Yep. Yeah, I got about two minutes left. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, and then I don't know. I don't know. I've attended all the. I've attended NAB and CES since 1979. Yeah, that's. Uh, that's quite a quite a challenge, but I try to make it every yeah, it is. every year. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of walking. <laughs> thirty uh, thirty. This will be thirty six for me. Thirty six years. Oh my gosh! I do things long term. So. I think you do, Tom. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's about now it. Now, what are you going to do when uh, some of your cohorts in New York calls you and say, "We like your work out there in L.A." But why don't you come back here in New York? It's the it's the seat of New CBS and. I'd love I'm, to have you. I'm not in it for the title. They'd have to open up a boatload of money. <laughs> it would. It would have to be. It's. I mean, it's a life-changing yeah. uh, event to have to relocate to New York. I've thought about that. With my wife and I've talked about that, but it, it would have to be an unbelievable opportunity for me. I'm sure. Uh, just to simply get a title. No, it's not worth it. Yeah. Because we own our house. Uh, Kids are settled, and mm -hmm. my wife is close to her parents, which is what she wants. Uh, we would not relocate unless the offer was ex extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty much planted here in Los Angeles, and uh, you know I, I love what I do. It's uh, it's I'm one of those rare uh, employees where you know I wake up in the morning, I'm going, God, you know, I'm excited to go to work because I love what I do. 
And there aren't too many people that like that are like that. You know, a lot yes. of people get up and go, oh, I gotta go to work again. It's like, I love my job. Excellent. So we don't want to we don't want to tell them too much that uh, I love what I do because you know it's uh, it's like oh we got uh, we got him you know he, he won't want to go anywhere. But no, this is this is the job of a mm -hmm. lifetime. Really, you 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 work an entire career to come to Los Angeles to work at the network, right. the big network, and this is the final resting place for many technicians. Mm -hmm. You work your whole life to come to CBS Television City. That's, uh, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough and uh, fortunate enough to have a lot of people in front of me that have carried me along and taught me everything they know. And, uh, and I, I've made it here, and I'm not, uh, I'm not looking to get out any time. It's what they call the golden handcuffs, where you, know, yeah. you have 25 years at CBS. And yeah. You're maxed, you know, six weeks vacation. You're maxed out on mm -hmm. pay and, and all kinds of stuff. And, higher up on the seniority list. So yeah. uh, I'm quite happy with uh, my career choices and uh, things are things are good. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy with uh, what I've done so far and I've got many more years to go. I'm only 53, so, yeah, so, you're, you're so sure I've have. got uh, many more. Maybe we can do this again in yeah. 20 years. 20 years from now. <laughs> How's it talking to us? Well, it's been great talking with you, Tom. We, hey, we, Jerry. Uh, very enjoyable. And Nice to hear the, that you're happy with your work. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I can uh, say that everyone I've talked to has said that. That's true. <laughs> I'm very fortunate to, to love what I do. Indeed. We've been talking with Tom Patterson. Uh, Tom is on the board of directors of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. Uh, we've done this recording at the CBS Studio Center, not to be confused with CBS Television City, two different entities, on uh, February the 9th of 2015. My name is Jerry Fry. I'm the audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters, and thanking you for listening. <laughs>